Hey, guess what, everybody? Go listen to the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John and Pete. This is Dr. Richard Lede. My views are my own views and not the views of my university. All right, hey, this is Pete from the Break It Down Show, and I've got two of my uh, war-tested battle buddies with me here. I have Dr. Richard Lede, who is my research partner. How's it going? And we have Mr. Will Hardy, who still works for the military. He's a former U.S. Marine intel guy who became a human training person like Rich and I, and we all did a bunch of training and a bunch of missions together, so we're just going to kind of talk about what we do and why it's valuable for commanders and give this out to folks like Duncan Hunter who maybe don't quite exactly get the value of what we do. And if you're interested in talking to us, you can always hit me up at www.peteaturner.com or you can tweet at the same place, peteaturner.com. And we're always glad to answer questions and, and do whatever we can to uh, help illustrate how challenging the modern combat situation is. So with that, I guess I'll, I'll throw I'll throw it over to you, Rich. Looks like you got something in front of you there. What are we uh, What are we going to discuss? This is the paper we're going to present tomorrow at the ethics conference for the Army. The Army's got an ethics conference. I'm, yeah, almost doesn't make sense to me, but sounds good. But this is our paper on female engagement operations, where we're outlining some of the ethical pitfalls. We're not saying we shouldn't have women in combat. I don't think that's what we're saying, right? What what is the point of a female engagement team? I don't know. We're still trying to figure that out, aren't we? We haven't. We don't, we don't even have a good definition yet, and we're not sure if one exists. The female engagement places. teams, though, they're supposed to be, I don't know, attached to a unit, part of a unit. Not even really sure, uh, but their job, their mission is to um, engage women in local population. What's your experience been, Will, with uh, female engagement teams? <laughs> My experience has been purposefully limited because every single time we had the option to bring one in, we said no, because a female engagement team has nothing to do with empowering a local community or gaining access to that community. It has everything to do with a commander putting a fit rep bullet on saying, I gave or I enabled a female engagement team to do A, B, and C. It doesn't matter that they only talk to 10 women in a community of 5,000 people or that they only hit that community for an hour and a half and are never going to go back to that community, they can say that that community has now been engaged and they are empowered and they are what I think the ultimate purpose of a female engagement team is to westernize the community. It doesn't matter what the community wants. It's that Western females went in and spouted what they wanted to say and doesn't matter what happens after that because the fit rep bullet is done. You're so cynical. So explain really quickly what a fit rep bullet is for those that don't know. So a fitness report is um, used in the military. It's basically how individuals in the military are rated. If you do great at your job, your fit rep is going to have bullets saying, I do great at my job, <laughs> and these are the numbers why. So your fit rep bullet, and this is me being extremely cynical and overgeneralizing, so please nobody get mad at me. Um <laughs> if I overgeneralize in an extremely cynical manner. But if you do 100 patrols, it doesn't matter the impact your patrols had. Your fit rep says, I did 100 patrols in this environment. And that goes into your promotion package. And where that becomes a problem is maybe the environment didn't need 100 patrols. Maybe the environment needed two patrols and it needed a QRF to stand by just in case another patrol happens. But no officer in the military can write, I did two patrols and sat on QRF for the local community for seven months. That won't get them promoted. So they go out and do 100 patrols. What's a, f what's a female engagement team supposed to be able to do, though? I mean, we understand the fit rep part and, and what the result is. But what, what's ideal? What works? Where, where, where should we be going? I... Personally, I think that, and this is my own personal opinion, I think maybe in the the FET teams might have success in, for example, promoting health, right? Health initiatives, health care initiatives. Um, so working in Afghanistan, one thing you learn quickly is that there's not a lot of medical facilities. If you can have midwives, right, that can help birth babies, that would be a huge win. But our FET teams aren't midwives, you know, and that, that's just, that's just one area. Um, but I think, I think Will's onto something where, you know, these, 
they might just be trying to, are, are we trying to westernize other women? It sure might appear that way to those other women that we're trying to engage. So, you know, and, and the paper that, that you and I wrote, Pete, with also with Sharon Amy, there's a woman on the paper. We got a, we got a woman, we got a female. We're actually, we're not making this stuff up. You know, we're, we're building on some pre-existing research that's critical of female engagement teams, largely because there's no real established doctrine for what they should be doing. So it's, it's still kind of this nebulous thing that causes a bit more confusion on the ground than I think you need. Because in theory, it sounds great. But in practice, I think it's, there's, there's a serious breakdown. Are you talking about practice? <laughs> He's talking about practice. So, okay. So female engagement teams don't have a dedicated doctrine. There's command influence to conduct the missions, but not to necessarily have successful or, or the measure of performance and the measure of effect aren't in line with each other. Is this something that the military can fix? What do you think, Will? Yeah, the military can fix it, but it's not an answer that the military is wanting to hear because conflict is supposed to be quick. Answers are supposed to happen, and we move on from conflict. We we enter a site, we fix a problem, and we leave a site with no regard to understanding the location. Female engagement teams absolutely can work, but they have to be dedicated to a location for time, and time is something that the majority of people in the military or out of the military are unwilling to give because time is money. Uh, a female engagement team cannot spend an hour and a half in one community and then say they had an impact on that community. Never to return. I, I, I don't think there's any organization within the military outside of one that kills people that can spend an hour and a half and have an impact on a community. Like there are some organizations that can go in and kill a community or kill some people in a community and have an impact. Right. But a civil affairs team can't spend an hour and a half somewhere and impact right. anything. You can't spend an hour and a half and build relationships or build trust. Oh. And relationships and trust are the two biggest things that a FET team needs to have with the community. Let's talk about relationships and trust because that's an important aspect. And it's it's a, the second argument that we make in our paper about female empowerment. And, and I should back out and say this also. Female empowerment is one of many things that we try to do in modern conflict areas. You talked about civil affairs teams that go out and they try to create some capacity. There's a lot of different rule of laws and other effort area. And all of these systems are, are beset by the same problems where we struggle to create trust. We struggle to be there long enough to do these things. So my question to the both of you is, is in terms of establishing trust and relationships, you guys have experience, verifiable experience of doing this well. How long does it take for you to begin to establish the trust? And then the next step from, from my point of view would be when that trust is strong enough, then it can be extended to another person who's not in your immediate circle. How long do those things take? What are the steps that you have to take to get to that kind of trust? I'm going to be rude and answer your question with a question, but <laughs> what access do you have in the relationship? Because trust can be built extremely quickly if you have access. If you are within a community daily for longer than a couple hours, longer than just patrolling in a community, if you're actually living in the community, you can build trust pretty rapidly. But if you have a three-hour patrol to a community once a week, you're not going to build trust. It, it might take you uh, an entire deployment to build trust, and odds are the trust that is built is going to be not because of anything you did. It's going to be because of an event that occurred that forged a relationship. And to me, those are two different types of trust. One's built off of individual action and what you do and what you influence, and the other's built on a car bomb went off in the community and we, we helped. So both are good, but we would obviously prefer not to have a car bomb go off in a community to gain trust. So You know, the part that you said, you, the, the stuff that you just said about access is important too because particularly in rural Afghanistan or I would guess even rural Iraq where you've spent a lot of time, Pete, um, what access do we actually have to women? You know, you can't just roll through a town and expect to see women hanging out on the block like you do in the United States, you know, so, or in any other Western country. I mean, for the most part, these women live, live their lives in a walled compound and they don't really 
You know, they're, they're completely segregated from men. And just because you go on a patrol and you have women in your patrol, you can't just expect to have access to women in a village cluster. Mm -hmm. Access isn't just about having time with them. If I'll, I'll uh, take it a step back and say, if you're going over to a buddy's house and you go through the window, your buddy's going to fucking <laughs> yell at you. He's going to be pissed because you did not access his house through the proper manner. So access isn't just about having time with them. You can't walk into a village and say, I'm going to spend time with your women. You got to have, you got to go through the front door. You got to talk to the people who you need to talk to, to get permission to talk to the women. And they've got to be able to trust you and their women have to be able to trust them. So you got to make sure you're talking to the right guy. You can't be talking to Joe Schmo, who the brigade thinks is the guy, even oh, though boy. nobody in the community respects him, which that might send Pete off on a tangent, yeah. but I'm going to, I'm going to try to not be tangential yet. Uh, I had no promises for later though, or even later in this comment as I, as my brain goes off on a tangent. Um, Let's go back to trust for a second, and I would say a couple things in response to your question. One is, is there's definitely different kinds of trust. There's the trust that, you know, hey, we're going to set up this meeting. It's going to happen next week, and I trust that it's actually going to happen, that you're actually going to show up. And that's a simple, low-risk trust. There are complex, high-risk trusts where I'm going to ask for entry into your cultural circle and be an extension of your your cultural mess. You know, I, I'm, they have to trust that I'm not going to put them in a position where now they are afraid, afraid for their lives or whatever it is. So that's certainly a higher order of trust and not one you build on a, on a patrol once a week. So you're talking about a partnering type, type of mission, but in a place where, as Rich was saying, women are cloistered mostly for their protection, mostly for religious importance. And we want to try to get access to those women. We have to first create trust with those elders that it's okay. And we might even talk about female hygiene, you know, Haji Kamal or whatever, whatever the guy's name is going to be. That would have to be okay. That takes, that's a high level of trust that we're going to access their female population and discuss because they don't even talk about lady parts. So how, do, how does one go about, and I'm asking the both of you, how does one go about building that level of trust where you can not only have an open conversation about this, but also project it out into a different area in that person's name. Well, I think you might not even be able to have some of those conversations at all. It just might simply be culturally inappropriate. But how do you find, you know, how do you find a way to talk about female hygiene, right? Well, first of all, you got to have permission to talk to the women, you know, and you can't just because you because you're a woman you can't just assume that you have access to another woman. I'm going to I'm going to build on something that Will said. It's, this stuff takes time. And we don't necessarily have the kind of I guess political willpower to do it, to invest the time that it takes and put the energy into into the relationship building that we need, you know. And also to get back to the idea of we we might just be giving the giving off the perception that we're trying to westernize Afghan women or Iraqi women, that's just not going to go over very well. You know, and that that's a messaging thing that we're probably failing to deliver the correct message about what we're trying to do in the first place. And, you know, I, not being a woman, I can say that being a Muslim woman is more than just wearing a headscarf, particularly in rural Afghanistan, where we're trying to advance our foreign policy interests. <clears throat> Part of that includes female engagement, but it's a tough thing to do and it's time consuming and I'm not I'm not convinced that we have the political willpower to do it. You can talk about trust and relationships, but trust starts before relationships. It yeah. starts with presence yeah. and what people see when they visibly look at you. General Petraeus, whatever he's done after he was brilliant in Iraq with the coin strategy. He was right. You got to take your eye pro off. You got to take your helmet off. You got to take your body armor off. Because if you are sitting in a meeting where everybody is showing that they're vulnerable, because let's face it, when you sit down with a group of people and you face them and you talk with them, you're showing them you are vulnerable. You're willing to open up to them. When you sit down at that meeting and they're being vulnerable to you, willing to communicate to you, but you have your body armor on, you have your helmet on, you're not taking your eye pro off. You're not sending that message that you're willing to trust them. And you have to be the, the step one of trust is being trustable. 
And if they don't view you as being trustworthy, that's game over. The game is over before you even started because you're giving off the signal that you don't trust them. So why should they trust you? And to me, that's, that's where it starts. And then you get into the conversation part of in the military people, they don't want to hear it. I, I cringe when I think it as a former Marine, but compassion. If, if you care about listening to what someone says, they're going to care about listening to what you say. But if you walk in there and you're talking to them and saying, Hey, Mr. Afghan, I'm major so-and-so in the army. And I'm here to tell you, this is how you're going to live your life for the next seven months because I'm here and I'm in charge. Game over. Like that door just got shut. You better hurry up and find a window to crawl through if you want to have any chance. Take that, that idea of being trustable and think about that in the, in, in the aggregate, because you know, in the minds of the Afghans, we're not, we're not to be trusted necessarily, especially when it comes to women. I think there's some, I mean, look, look at how Western women are portrayed in our own media, mm -hmm. right? And you might have Mr. Afghan living in the hills, but he's, he's not complete. He's not a complete idiot. He, he sees some things in the West that he's not happy about, particularly how women are portrayed, how we portray women or how women portray themselves. But that is not, that is not how an Afghan woman is supposed to conduct herself. So I think first and foremost, you know, we have to deal with that and manage that perception before we start to try to have our women engaging their women. Because it's not as easy as, you know, either, any one of us trying to go and engage a few, a few mullahs down at the walking through the bazaar, you know, or some shopkeepers or whatever. As males, we have a certain advantage. But I don't think our policymakers... Anybody up there in the spaceship, I don't think they're necessarily understanding that when they're telling commanders, you got to do female engagement. Mm -hmm. And the key difference between an invader and a liberator is perception. And it's the individual, it's the locals perception. A liberator comes in and your life continues how you want it to continue. You're in control. A liberator doesn't tell you how to live. An invader comes in and says, this is how you're going to live. Now that FET team, when they're going out, there's no doctrine to tell uh, a female captain that's in charge of the team what she's supposed to do. So she's doing what the person before her said works or what didn't work. So she might be going out and telling Afghan women, you need to be more empowered. You need to change this. The women go home and the men hear about it. And all of a sudden they're like, holy shit, these guys aren't liberating my community. They're trying to change my community. So now they're an invader. And that just feeds the the Western invader. like. Uh, line of thought that the Taliban uses and we use that we use the term empowerment and this is something that we that's in the existing literature even that word may not translate across cultures because you know here in the west we tend to think of empowerment as a positive thing but you know empowerment in an, in another setting might actually mean you you are gaining at someone else's expense mm -hmm. and it, you know language matters so the way we even talk about these things and again, I'm, you know, kind of pointing the finger at policymakers here, policymakers in the West who still haven't, you know, we, we still don't have equal rights between the, the sexes here in the United States. Women do have opportunities that they did not have 100 years ago, but by no means do we have perfect equality here. So I think that the idea of empowerment needs to be reconsidered if that is the goal of a FET is to empower women, then that needs to be, that needs to be reconsidered. That is a lot about female empowerment. As we said before, though, it's only one facet of what you have to do in a modern conflict situation as a human terrain or human domain type person. There's a lot of other things that are impacting our ability to create stability in a region. What other things will, do you think are important as far as lines of effort go or other things where you've seen where we have a very benign, even benevolent uh, uh, intent, but our production is anything but that. It causes more chaos than anything else. Then there's, there's a lot of different areas, so you don't have to pick all of them, but just <laughs> yeah, where to begin? Um, <laughs> yes, I I bring a very bottom up view because I've 
in the military, my deployments to Iraq were at a battalion. My mm -hmm. deployments with a human train system were at a regiment and lower, and then on the soft side with a, a platoon of soft guys. Mm -hmm. So very bottom-up view. So I may not have the same opinions as someone who was sitting up at ISAF headquarters. Right. But I'll, I'll tell you what the lines of effort need to be. Okay. Actually, I can't tell you what the lines of effort <laughs> need to be because I'm not talking to anybody right now. Right. But – if if you give me a patrol to go out and provide security, yes. I can go talk to the people. I can talk to the leadership of those people. I can have them glad hand the local governor, and I can have them sit down. Or I can't have them do it. I can suggest, and hopefully they do it on their of their own will. But they develop the lines of effort. If you're in a counterinsurgency, yeah. and the the foreign military is producing lines of effort and telling the locals these are your priorities, right? No, it's that's wrong. This is a, a powerful thing you're saying, and we were fortunate enough to to catch a governor that would allow us to sort of get into his brain and see what he was doing. And when we finally got him to fully trust us, and this was after I thought I already had trust, he gave us his plan. He's like, "Here's what I want to do over the next year. This is this is what I'm trying to get done." And uh, literally, no one had ever asked this guy this question. So I sat down with him. It got him to go through the process several times of explaining everything. And we talked about scheduling and, and priority and all these other things. He pulled out what would be a PowerPoint slide for the military to say, here is the plan for this governor. And then I took it. And as I made the PowerPoint slide, I purposely made mistakes in it and misordered things. And, and I got it wrong. And when I brought it back to him, he said, this is all wrong. And he fixed it back to the way he had explained it the day before. So it was a good, solid, tested plan. And it didn't mirror what we were doing. In some ways it did, but in a lot of ways it didn't. But it talked about, it talked about agricultural development, female, uh, education, male education. But the main thing, the first three things on his list were security. And it wasn't that it was security, security, security. It was the elder or the dad of the family, whoever was going to be needed to be able to go to and from their workplace, whatever it was going to be. If they needed to go secure towels because they're going to sell them at their store. They need to do that and feel safe about doing it. While they're gone, their compound has to be safe. And that includes when they're home at night, like they can't have nightmen coming up and, and threatening kidnapping and that kind of thing. And also they have to know that their kids can leave the compound and go to school safely and return. And if you couldn't meet all three of those requirements, then there were no other priorities. Mm -hmm. If you like the show, and you know you do, send us some pictures of your movies. Don't do that. Support the show. There are three ways you can support us. Number one, go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. And leave a five-star rating and review. It helps with the show metrics, and it helps us get better placement. Number two, visit our website, www.breakitdownshow.com. We've got an Amazon and an eBay link. Same Amazon, same eBay, you know and love but they give us a little kickback when you get to their site from ours. And number three, leave comments about the shows that you like. We want to know what you think, how you feel. Tell us how to make the show better. We greatly appreciate it. Now back to the show. We like boobies. And even though female education was his number one priority, is how he said it, that's my number one priority, male education had to come first because in their country right now, the males have to be able to provide for their family. And so at the expense of female education, males had to be educated. But he absolutely was critical that women, our young girls, have to be educated, but it has to work in this fashion, which still doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us. But in there, if you dig hard enough, you can you can lay out a plan on how he wanted to approach it. Because it feels wrong to us to say, well, women are second class, but it's not that they're second class, it's that they're their education goes back to the home at 9, 10, 11, 12 years old so they can start to become a housewife as, as opposed to uh, an astronaut or whatever it was mm -hmm. going to be. Yeah, and he, this particular governor, this governor had several young daughters himself, you know. So, but at the same time, he wanted to see his daughters educated. He also wanted his sons to be good Afghan fathers, you know. So he had a, he has, he's got a dual responsibility and he knows it. But yet, no one's going to get educated if you can't if you can't even walk through the bazaar without worrying about getting blown up. And what's uh, the typical American solution if security's bad? What's the first thing that we do? Just posing a question, and I'll answer it here. We, we provide security. We put troops on the <laughs> ground, and we provide security. What's the number one thing you must have in order to have an attack? 
between two conflicting sides. Both sides must be present. <laughs> if, if, yeah, you got to keep the Taliban out of an area. But if people are saying, I want to be able to walk down this road without worrying about a bomb or without having to have an ambush break out at any minute, well, then it's our job to avoid that road to enable that community to be able to function on its own. We have to find, we can't say it's the easy thing for us to use that road. We have to find a new way to provide security there without endangering that community. Because the more we endanger that community, the more we delegitimize the government that's supposed to be providing security, and the more we push them towards another form of government. Guess what? The Taliban might be able to provide security on that road because the Taliban goes where we are. And if Americans can't get to the road, well, then there's no reason to plant a bomb on that road, and it's now secure. That's true. <laughs> so I know you're not on the ground right now to determine that, and we've talked about how plans come out from Afghans, but we still have things we go and we do. And uh, we try to create uh, governance. We try to create influence. But we still seem to fail at that, partly because, you know, we're more, more worried about what our commander is going to do. I, I've watched us uh, prepare for an ambassador visit and, and freak out about what the ambassador was going to say or do. And then in the same conversation, the same paragraph of the conversation, talk about how we're going to force the Afghan governor to do something. And they don't even know what's coming. So what do we how do we change that mindset where we're very, very worried about our own boss and, and our own uh, objectives that are set up at a strategic or policy level, as Rich likes to talk about, versus what has to happen. And, and we are, we're all ground guys. So how do we, how do we get an organization to look more at the ground to give a general who doesn't know the ground truth, the ground truth? I have a quick answer for that one. And it, we may not be able to talk further about it, but it's a talent management issue. If you have talent management and officers get promoted a certain way when they're stateside or when they're in training, that does not work when you go into conflict. Quantitative numbers put down on a fit rep does not reflect actual success on the ground. So the army need, or not the army, the military needs to find out when we're in a deployed situation, how do we manage our talent? How do we keep guys' careers going? Because it, it doesn't matter that someone did 20 civil affairs missions and sharpened axes. It's, when they sharpened those axes, did they put anybody out of work and did they cause more instability by doing it? And right now, the current talent management structure within the military doesn't account for actual on-the-ground success. It's American successes that gets me measured, not local success. And a lot of those successes that you're talking about are extremely hard to measure because you can't always see them immediately. Exactly. It takes Sometimes it takes years to realize what happened. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, with those with with those new metrics that you're asking for that needs to be a little bit more open-ended and it's not just a bunch of statistics either you know there, there needs to be some qualitative component mm -hmm. that you should have i mean I, I guess you have you have it to some degree already but i would also i would add to what you just said and say you know there needs to be some management of our expectations and again this is talking to policymakers and the american public in general if, if we take it back to the female engagement thing if you want to engage women for the purpose of making their lives better well then we need to manage our expectations and figure out what's realistic in our deployments maybe our deployment cycles need to change maybe there needs to be some different overlap maybe we need to send people back to the same place once they've gone to the rear and had some rest right so that they can maintain those relationships but again this is this is why I say we don't necessarily have the political willpower to do this because we can change some of these things. We can change the way the DOD operates with policy. That's not that's not hard. Oh, wait, it actually is very hard. But I think some expect some some management of our expectations would go hand in hand with, you know, with what you just said about metrics of success. That's some involved in-depth stuff that you just dropped on us. That's fantastic. Talked a little bit about lines of effort and, and why it's even difficult even just to establish those. Uh, political will. We've talked about female empowerment. This just illustrated just how complicated this stuff is, gentlemen. So I wanted to try to maybe pull it out again and go get a little bit bigger and maybe we can approach it from uh, one of the theories that Rich and I are working on and we haven't quite written it out yet, but basically that there are five elements 
to winning a modern combat fight. And one of those is military for sure. And for that, you got to talk to Don Vandegrift and understand adaptive leadership. But also there's the political, social, cultural, and by, with, and through religion elements. What do we need to change to get better, to deal with those? And are there any other elements that are in there that are critical for us to be able to actually create stability in a place that is, its norm is instability? The first thing that stands out to me is our military has become a Swiss army knife in the public perception, Our mili- which the military has outstanding individuals in it and outstanding organizations that can meet and at least deal with, maybe not solve a problem, but they can deal with a, a problem. And they're, they're two very different things. Dealing with a problem makes it go away for a little bit. <laughs> Solving a problem makes it go away forever to a better, with a better end. Um, but our military is not a Swiss army knife. They are trained to do specific things extremely well. If we continue to ask the military to do things that they are not trained to do, well, then the answer is to find either civilian or contract solutions to enable the military. I know we're all biased because we were part of human train system, which uh, I'll be honest, a lot of fuck ups in the human train system <laughs> that as a program administratively and with a lot of the individuals, a lot of screw ups in the human train system. Well documented screw ups, <laughs> extremely well documented screw ups. That being said, the human train system met and fulfilled a gap that the military still struggles with to this day. If you are a company commander, a battalion commander, a brigade commander, hell, if you are a, a three-star general who's in charge of an entire country, there are only 24 hours in a day. And within those 24 hours, you're stuffing 36 hours worth of your work that has to do with the entire world um, I, I can't even think of, I mean, you're dealing with administrative stuff, you're dealing with logistics stuff, you're planning operations, you're doing all of that at, but you don't have the time to, uh, deal with the social aspect. So the military needs to provide you with someone whose entire job is to look at the social aspect. If you're a company commander, your time is extremely valuable and your resources are limited. You don't have the time to understand the social aspect of your area of operations. So the military needs to provide you with someone who's dedicated to look at it. And right now, that's something. It, they got rid of the human train system. Uh, Representative Hunter is very anti anything social sciencey, smelling, tasting, or you know, if it resembles social science, the the military can't do anything with it. But the military needs it because you can't be asking a company commander to put his guy's lives on the line when he doesn't understand the social situation he's getting into. So you got to have someone who's paid to focus on that social situation and social. You guys mentioned five. What were they again? Obviously militarily and then social, political, cultural, by, with, and through religion. So on paper, political state deals with that. Hopefully, hopefully, yeah. hopefully. Sorry. That, that just, <laughs> I laughed out loud. Yeah. So, but on paper, state deals with political. Military side, military's got that, of course. Religious side, military can kind of get to that. They've got chaplains, but they're not really, they're not really getting it. But the social and the cultural aspect, the military is not capable of getting, or the military as it is does not have the resources to understand it. They, they can teach soldiers how to do it and they'll do a great job, but then they have to ask those soldiers to do it. And it, I, I was I was in the Marine Corps. If you told me I get to go shoot something, I'm going to do it with a lot of gusto. If you told me I got to go listen to someone talk and try to understand their feelings, <laughs> uh, can I go shoot something? <laughs> you know, one of the best compliments that I got in Afghanistan, you got this compliment too, Pete. We got this compliment. We had a commander tell us that, you know, it wasn't just that we were helping him understand what the Afghans were up to. But we did a good job of helping the Afghans understand what the army was up to. And I thought that was one of the that was one of the most positive compliments. That was the best compliment I ever got in the human terrain system, I think. But a commander recognized we all, he was also a good commander who knew how to use us and put us in a position and set us up with the resources and made it known to his guys what we were there to be doing. And, you know, he he enabled us, but it was that two-way communication. That that really made me think I was doing a good job to hear that from a battalion commander. Would you say you enabled a partnership? 
I think we did. I think mm. that's that's I, what that's what I did. I don't know. That's I, what I tried to do. I feel like partnership is a big word in the military right now, especially the army. That they everything they do is trust and enabling partnerships because the future, at least the next decade, is us partnering with other nations to fight these small little wars against localized elements, radical elements. Partnership. Yeah, the last two chief of staffs of the army have talked specifically about creating capacity within our partners and we struggle with partnership honestly we do and and here is a good illustration as to why so i was just recently on the jay moore show and we talked about all the things i did with the afghans which is very important and it colors all the whole experience but i've always said that i spent more time and we just had this conversation on the way back from the restaurant i've always spent more time engaging with us so that I have the necessary influence. You know how important the influence is, Will, to, to be able to get off the camp, you know, to get into a helicopter or a vehicle. Rich and I had, had a great relationship. It was handed off commander to commander. And the guy said, all I want to do is make sure I don't drop the ball. And he couldn't get us off the camp, you know, so we had to spend all this time repartnering with our own people. I had to bring ice cream. I, I figured out I better bring ice cream to this remote camp. And, uh, uh it's funny because the, uh, the captain responsible for getting them food, he's like, no, they have ice cream. Like, no, they don't have ice cream. They never get ice cream because it doesn't get airdropped because it melts before it gets there. So I took ice cream and that allowed me and Jay Moore got it instantly. He's like, oh my God, you've got to, you've got to do this two ways. Mm-hmm. So if it's hard for me to partner with me, <laughs> how do we, how are, legitimately the real hard question is, is, how the fuck are we going to do it with people cross culture, cross religion, cross language, across objectives, all these different things that we have to, all these different little riverlets that we have to get over to figure out, you know, how to even start to build trust. What, what the heck do we do? Or what have you done, Will? What have you done, Rich, to accomplish getting over those things? It takes expertise and understanding. And expertise is something that comes with experience. And you can't ask a if there is not that human terrain type person there to facilitate, you can't ask a major who's never dealt with another culture to have the experience and expertise to take the time to understand the other side, the his partner. He's just going to say, I'm in the military. We're very type A. I tell you, you to do this. You do this. We have a good relationship. He's not going to try to understand the the back and forth. And that's something that that human train element brings in. But human train system specifically didn't bring in expertise because, like we said earlier, half of the program <laughs> weren't quite experts at anything. But when when the human train system did it right, they brought expertise that enabled understanding. Yeah, because the you know we use the term culture a lot, but it's. It's not something you can, I mean, you can read about other cultures all day long, but until you experience it, once you've experienced something, you can then help others to learn it a little bit better. One thing that I, I'd liked, well, one thing that I thought that I was supposed to do in the human terrain system was, was also help teach the army. You know, I thought that was part of my job and I'm, I'm a teacher by trade. So it's kind of, it's easy for me to lecture anybody, but you know, part of, part of teaching requires an understanding of what your students are going through. Talk about, we, we got to keep building relationships with ourselves, you know, but it's also, you know, part of that is teach, we had to teach them what we do because they, there was a fundamental lack of understanding amongst some people in the army about what, what were we even there for? Why does Dr. Lede have a beard? You know, what's, what's going on here? Dr. Lede and Pete show up to the front gate and, and just leave. What are they doing? Well, they're, they're partnering, but we still have to teach, we still have to teach these things. So I think part of, what the human terrain was supposed to be doing. And I think some, some people caught on to this, but part of it was involved some degree of teaching and that teaching though, you got to learn from experience, especially when you're dealing with culture. But again, I'll go back and say, I don't, I don't know if we're willing to put in the time that it takes to build these relationships. So we can actually say, we don't just have a relationship. We have a partnership. Yeah. And when it comes to partnering too, especially in a conflict zone, especially once you've established trust, it's, almost unfair to everybody involved to leave Mm -hmm. after a year, after nine months, whatever it's going to be. And then to maybe never come back or maybe come back to a different, you know, province. And maybe sometimes you do need to go back to a different place, but how powerful is it if that military unit or that commander was tied to that region 
where they could come back and continue the progress and, and not only have that relationship with that local command, that local government leader, but also be handing off something that they started, you know, okay, now here, I've handed you back this thing. By the way, all those initiatives you started five years ago are all dead. And would make you relook and go, gosh, all these pictures that I have of my success in my scrapbook are, are bullshit. You know, I've got really got to pay attention. I've got to make sure I get a better handoff. Cause I, I think from my experience, multiple times of watching units swap in and out, the units have the best intent. They're highly trained. They're just not trained in the right things. And they really suck at transferring a legacy. And I, I know you've seen this, Will, where, where a unit comes in and, and can't possibly bother to carry the ball that was given to them. Absolutely. And I like to look at it from the Afghan's perspective. If, if we're in hypothetical Afghanistan, <laughs> if you've got a long war, a war that's 10 plus years, how many units do you need to have come through where it seems like they don't learn from the unit before them? If you spend a year teaching a guy everything, let's say I'm an Afghan and I have a great relationship with the battle space owner. And I teach him everything that I know about it. And he gets it. And he rotates out and has a shitty turnover. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, damn, that sucks. But I'm going to try. I'm going to try again. I'm going to – another year of I'm going to really try. He start The American starts to get it. He rotates out, never to be seen again. And a new guy comes in. Now you're like, shit, I just wasted two years of my life. All right, I'm going to try a little bit this time. And it – now the American is saying, this guy's not even trying to have a relationship with me. But, I mean, I'm the Afghan. I'm going to try a little bit. Guy rotates out a year later. And I'm like, fuck, this is pointless. This is Groundhog Day, and it's nothing but empty uniforms coming up to me, and I have to have the same conversation over and over and over. While people are dying that you know. While people are dying. Pretty soon... I don't care that the Americans want to have a meeting. I don't want to put the effort into it. You know what? My daughter is sick. My grandfather's sick. I've got a field or I've got a shop. I need to make money. I don't care what the Americans say because six months from now, it's going to be another empty uniform who doesn't want to, who, who he may have the best, that empty uniform may have the best intentions, but he doesn't have the time to be able to make an impact. Yeah, and you don't want to have the same conversation again that you've had four, five, six, seven, eight. How, how long have we been there? 15, 15 years? Yeah, hey, exactly. I I had to build some really – I'm a history buff. I love history, and I worked with some guys that – Afghan guys that were uh, – they were young guys during the Mujahideen, Mujahideen era, and they watched their fathers fight, and they did a little fighting themselves. And it took me asking many times to be like, hey, tell me some stories. I just personally – I want to experience what you went through. And finally they were like, you know what? I've told these stories to people before and it didn't do anything. So it, it took months before I finally got to sit down over a meal and have stories and be like, so that's how you lost your fingers. That's, that's amazing. That's a great story. And then personal jokes come. The, the lost your fingers guy was holding an RPG wrong. So then next time we were in a gunfight and he was there and one of his guys had an RPG, I looked at him and I said, look at your guy. He's about to become like you. <laughs> and he starts laughing and that's rapport. Right. Uh, and it, it took time. And that process was damaged by the people before me who didn't take the time to. It, and it's not their mistake. We'll say that it's the lack of training, the lack of organizational learning that holds those lessons. Right. It, it, if you bring a horse to water and he doesn't drink, right. you can't force him. But if the horse doesn't know he's supposed to drink the water, you right. can't get mad at the horse. You can't get mad at the horse. And what we're asking our service members to do is impossibly hard. It's an area that has been unstable for decades. And you don't just come in five years. I, I remember we were getting ready to pull out of, of Iraq. And I'm looking around. I'm like, they don't even have a library or a fire department. No one believes in the police. And we're about to leave. Like what, what have we accomplished here? You know, and, and it's, it's just, it goes to illustrate how challenging the modern combat situation is because someone like you, and I'll, I will say this, it's a compliment to you, but it's very rare what you were able to do. You realized that there had been a lesson taught to the Afghans about against sharing their history and through your own personal intuition and, and desire to learn, you were able to trick that negative thing and maybe start to change it back. 
but then I redeployed. So right, exactly, yeah. And so and so it all goes away. So you have this lesson that's taught. We have the same thing um, in a place in Iraq where the Iraqi commander, he was a general, he was going to come onto the camp, and uh, the new unit was there, and they're like, "No, absolutely not. You're not coming on the camp." Well, first off, he's the Iraqi general for that area. He can go wherever he wants. But we don't take that view of it. We take that view as he's the enemy. Well, guess what? You leave a general, any general, in a Humvee cooking outside a gate where he's supposed to be able to go in, you you might never repair that damage. Mm -hmm. And it took only because we recognized it and, and the guy that I work with, Night Train. By the way, you should check out the Night Train show. It's uh, one of the recent episodes. It's fantastic about how we treat our interpreters. You want to learn more about modern combat? Listen to that show. Couple it with this and we'll get you there. But we'll explain the whole mosaic of all this stuff but imagine that will rich that you've taken the number one iraqi partner in the area and you left him in his car in 120 degree heat denying him access to the place that he would go if, if general petraeus had shown up and that had happened careers would be over but we have such disdain for our own partner open disdain that now you have to spend months literally months repairing this relationship and and you don't even know if you ever get it all the way back. And I I didn't ask for that burden, you mm -hmm. know. But it was because of of our disdain, our lack of training to specifically handle these things. So in a lot of ways, I'll, I'll say this: in a lot of ways, uh, and you've you've kind of taught me this, Will. Is is we have to hire this expertise. We have to hire Will because the, we can't expect the military to have all this down. There's just no way. What are your What are your guys' thoughts on on that kind of experience where we have these hugely detrimental simple things that happen that are invisible to us. I mean, that was invisible to the military, what you found out. Mm -hmm. No one knew about their, like, I'm not going to tell you my war stories because it just doesn't matter, you know? And, and that, what a simple, we call it fence posting, what a simple way to make, hey, you're like me, I'm like you. You know, you were in combat, I was in combat. I love your story. Here's my story. Back and forth, all of a sudden, you've got an instant rapport. That's been denied to everybody after whoever that person was burned the story up for mm -hmm. the last time. Um, and just a, a quick aside, you, you did a, a throwback to your interpreter show and how to work with interpreters. One aspect nobody ever thinks about with interpreters is what happens after we're gone. And in my personal life right now, I'm fighting a battle with the National Visa Center to get interpreters and their family members who worked with the United States for years to get visas. They risked their life for Americans. They enabled Americans to be able to do their job, but America is hanging them out to dry, putting asinine rules, extending it to two years that they need to have evidence for, then being, then recently, I think back in March, Congress told the State Department, no, you have to make it one year. But guess what? National Visa Center is still asking for two years. Top's not talking to the bottom. And every single day that my, I, I call them brothers because they went through yeah. a lot with me, or in Afghanistan, their lives are at risk. So if people listen to the interpreter show, I think this is an idea for another show. What happens to interpreters after we leave? And this what can our country yeah. do for them? This stuff can be fixed with policy, though. But yeah, again, we don't, we don't have the political will to do it. We got a Congress that's unwilling to do it. And I'm not, I'm not getting partisan here because I'm, I'm a fierce moderate. <laughs> I'm an extreme <laughs> moderate, you know, but... You can fix some of these problems with policy, but to fix these things with policy first requires an open mind. And you can't be always ideological about something and expect to solve some of these problems that we're talking about. Because ideology is generally just one direction and this is the right way. A lot of the success that, well, I would say to a large part, the success that all three of us had in the field was because we had an open mind. And, you know, it's, it's very hard to train a 19 year old infantryman from the bayou to have an open mind, right? Lucky for me, I had one, you know, already. But how do you train a person to open up their mind to a different culture, to open up their mind to a new type of military, mm -hmm. you know? Because, yeah, we can fix these things with policy, but that requires us educating the public about what's, what's happening. Because part of the reason we don't have the political will, as I like to say, the political willpower. To do some of these things, it's because we've, we've got an edu we got a public that's largely disconnected from the fight. We got an all volunteer force, so people also aren't invested. You know, their personal lives aren't invested in the same way that you know we used to have a draft. Everybody got involved. Everybody was was contributing to the war effort. We don't do that anymore. You know, and I'm 
I'm all about the all volunteer force. It has its advantages, but you know, you got to have a public that is invested in fixing this, you know, this visa program mm -hmm. because it's the public that puts pressure on our lawmakers to fix these things. You got to have a public that's invested in, you know, making sure that the military, if it's going to be a one size fits all military, it's going to be a Swiss army knife. Well, then we got to make sure that we're giving the military the tools and giving commanders the flexibility to do things like promote the right people. Don't just let all your metrics be based on statistics. Well, we're starting a conversation. You know, we're, we're you know, Pete's got his podcast here, the Break It Down Show is part of that, right? Educating people about some of these things that we've seen that other people just, for the most part, our brother and sister citizens have not seen. And with the, it's near and dear to my heart, but with the interpreter thing, you take that a few years down the road, everything we do in a conflict zone socially is done through an interpreter. Yeah. And they're done. And I'm biased, but I like local interpreters because they are not just interpreters. They are, they're cultural interpreters. They have access that a guy that spent a decade in America just isn't going to have. And what happens when they're forgotten and we move on to the next war? It, it's a global community. Everybody in every country can read the news. Yeah. And all they need to do is hear that Americans forget their interpreters after they leave. It, say we go to war with, with Canada and we need interpreters that can speak some French Canadian up right. there. Nobody's going to want to work with us because after we leave, if the bad guys take back over, they're going to come and kill them because they worked with Americans. Like the only reason you work with Americans is because it's a lifeline to maybe get to the American dream. And the American dream isn't just in America. It's all right. over the world. That's true. It's absolutely true. I've worked with a lot of interpreters, both, from America, not necessarily Americans, but people that reside here are citizens, but I've also worked with locals and they are often, I'll say the word desperate to get to America and they love us. They love what we stand for. They want more of it and they literally have no other way to get there. And it breaks my heart to think about the guys that would love to be here who would be great Americans. And maybe they are the goofiest Islamic Arab Americans ever invented and they all live up in Flint, Michigan for some crazy ass reason. But I would, t well, I've put my life in their hands and, and vice versa. You know, I mean, how can you not want someone like that in your country? You mm -hmm. know, and, and we have a, we have an immigration problem in general, but couldn't we just, if we're going to bend the rules for everybody, <laughs> we would be nice to help the guys that are like, I stood by with you toe to toe, you know, uh, and, and we did it. And you're right. These guys are, I'm a big proponent of this and I'll say this over and over again. I have no problem defending it. An individual language capacity really is irrelevant. It's nice if you've got it, but the time you spend doing that, if you spent 10% of that time learning how to deal with an interpreter at an advanced level, you can go anywhere in the world and have a fantastic relationship because that person in between, you two, that interpreter is a cultural negotiator in both directions. They're a representation of your partner and their representation of you. And if you treat them like that kind of a tool, which we all know the training does not support that, it supports that they're going to deceive you and trick you. And um, an interpreter is a mentor to you. Yeah. Because, and, yeah. and to the person they're talking to because yes. they're teaching the whole time they're interpreting, they're teaching the other like, hey, you shouldn't have said this to him or right. your body posture looks like crap. Maybe. Right. They're going to realize that. And th that goes both ways too. Also, like I always mentor uh, my interpreters. I give them flexibility. Don't, don't ever, I'll tell you right now, if you're in the military person and my interpreter is on your camp and you want to be a dick to him, get ready. Mm -hmm. Cause I will bring the big, I don't get mad about many things. I'm not even mad about that, but I will blow that up. So the last thing you ever want to do is go after my interpreter and be a dick to him. Cause <laughs> I will tear that down. Those guys work hard. They deserve a chance to uh, to have the American dream, and, and it kills me that we can't get something that simple figured out, that the top and the bottom aren't talking, mm -hmm. because it makes me want to go get a boat, a shipping container, and bring them over, and just be like, hey, look, no, these guys are Cuban. Come on in. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a shame. So we've covered a lot of ground. I do want to say this to Duncan Hunter. So you have to listen, Duncan, at how complex this stuff is. And I know you're a veteran of the Iraq war and you get all this stuff, but if you don't have someone like Will Hardy standing there helping you, if you don't have someone like Dr. Richard Lede standing there helping, how do these commanders handle these impossible 
situations that they're given when they're not given the right kind of training. They're given training that's important and it's military training and vital. But at some point, like Will said, you run out of the capacity to develop any more expertise and you just simply, you can be a Swiss army knife, but if I'm a chainsaw and you got to cut down trees, you'll get that tree cut down with a Swiss army knife, but which, which tool do you want? And you only have 24 hours in a day and it's a guarantee you have 24 hours in the day you're going to be taking care of your troops first you're going to be doing all that stuff to make sure your guys are good before you ever start wondering what uh haji what's his face is dealing with you're i mean that's simple math you take care of yours before you take care of the other so the military needs a capability to have someone that can focus on the other and whether that's to me um I've talked with Pete about this a couple times. I see it going three ways uh, to enable the military and to have a social component. You either keep it in-house and you get military officers that are willing to get the education, get the experience to be able to do what needs to be done. But you're asking them to take a halt in their career. You're asking them to take a billet that their peers aren't going to be going into when they could be taking a joint billet or a command billet. They're going to be taking this oddball little social billet. So you're asking guys to risk their careers, which means they're risking their family. So that's, that's not a good option because no major that wants to see Lieutenant Colonel is going to say, absolutely, I'm going to go be a social guy while my best friend's going to go be a company commander. That, that just won't fly. Otherwise, you're going to put the crappy major in that position, which that won't fly because putting a, a a shitty person into a shit, uh, an important spot doesn't work. So doing it in house won't work. You can do it contractor, but contractor contracting positions are band aids. The military hires contractors when the military doesn't have an immediate solution for an immediate problem. That doesn't. That's putting a band aid over a gunshot wound to the belly when you actually need to get in there and stitch some intestines back together. So that it's immediate solution, but it's not a permanent solution. Or you can do what HTS did, which this is the third bullet, but it's third bullet with an asterisk. HTS had department of the army civilians, but they were term hires. So you got these people wanting to be tourists in a combat zone. You got academics saying, I'm going to go do this cool thing for a little bit, write these reports, push my agenda and then go back and be a professor at my school. That doesn't work because HTS is the example. So when we say the Army needs social capability, we're not saying the Army needs HTS. The third option without the asterisk is the Army needs Department of the Army civilians. They need a way to hire people and train people and retain people. They need to hire someone, bring them on with the experience, give them a deployment, have them come home, train other people, have them stay within the program, and have them have a career within that program. That way, by the time they're in year number five, they're experts at what they're doing. Hopefully, they were experts before, but they're really experts by year number five, year number 10. And to me, that's the solution. But you can't have Representative Hunter saying social science, no. There, he actually wrote a letter to the uh, Secretary of the Army, and in that letter, he mentioned a paper I wrote saying there's a conspiracy that to bring HTS back, and it's an Army-wide conspiracy. No, Representative Hunter, it's not an Army-wide conspiracy. It's the Army saying, we have a gap, and we need to fill the gap. And I was one individual who wrote a paper and saying, a social science component fills that gap. And you you need to be able to listen to people saying that that happens. Yeah, I think we would agree that the HTS model did what it was supposed to do. And first first swings at things are often goofy. We've learned a lot of the things that worked. There are plenty of people that didn't belong in the program. There was a whole lot of mismanagement and there was a whole lot of sexual harassment. It sounds like a governmental program to me. But you're right. That need is critical. And if the turn of the day theory of, of five critical elements of combat is true, and, and we believe that it is, then you show me a unit that can win militarily, socially, culturally, politically, and by, with, and through religion, and I'll buy you a sandwich. Because that, that unit, hell, I'll buy you a Ferrari. That unit doesn't exist because no one trains on that. They're not supposed to. You go to NTC, you fire tables so you can get into combat and the fold the gap. That's what we're built on right now. No one's going to be able to tell you intelligently about how they're going to build trust, 
how they're going to leverage their interpreter to be a social magnet, what to do with the Stesiphon arch when they see it, and how, how to change stability because of, of this, this historic icon that's there. That's directly pointed at Representative Hunter and anybody else who's critical of the social capability of a human terrain type program. And, and by the way, I'll say this too. It doesn't belong inside of a skiff top secret style. We need people that don't necessarily have top secret clearances who aren't afraid to grab a backpack and go get dirty and go learn about Liberia. So when we go to Liberia next time, it's not a total surprise when we get there. But why would you not give the military something that it needs? That's, that's, that's a simple question. Why would you not give them this kind of capability? Or why would you try to take it away because it was mismanaged poorly the first time? Um, I understand that, but is that not just, you know, a knee jerk reaction? I would say this too. You know, we have a lot of people that pay taxes that listen to this show. I would challenge you, the taxpayer, to listen to this show and say, gosh, I didn't realize combat was that complicated. And notice that we did not talk about how dangerous combat is. Combat absolutely is dangerous. People get blown up and killed. But that is not the norm. The normal deployment is you come back and, and you don't have an external wound. You're not missing a leg. People aren't being shot at every second of the day. I've been on a thousand combat patrols. And yes, I've been shot at and blow it up and all those things. But most patrols are benign. You go out and you engage with people. And you try to figure out what the fuck is going on. And, and I don't know if you would, because you've been in harder areas than I have, but the standard mission, I, I'm ready for a firefight, but I don't get in one typically. Yeah. Uh, you always prepare for the firefight, but it, it doesn't always come. Even, even when you know that the Taliban, you can listen to the Taliban chatter and you know they're right there. Taliban can look at you and on some days you look like you're ready for a fight and on other days you look a little lax. If you look like you're ready for the fight, the Taliban guy's gonna say, "Damn, they got their snipers on point right now." They let's 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 see how we feel tomorrow. So even when you're ready for a fight, the fight doesn't always happen. To the point you were just making, if somebody came up and said, "My son's a soldier and he didn't have sappy plates," mm -hmm. and that went to a, a representative in, in in Congress, I guarantee a shit fit would be thrown and he would have sa he would have six sappy plates even though he can only wear two. Sappy plates are protective plates that keep you safe from bullets. Yeah, or, or safer. Or we can say uh like yeah, we'll just keep it sappy plates cuz my first deployment with the Marines we wore army sappy plates that were ACU so our our sides blended in with concrete even though there was no concrete around. Um but that's neither here nor there. But if one person complained and said Soldiers don't have sappy plates, it would get fixed. We're here complaining soldiers don't have a social capability, but representatives are saying so soldiers don't need a social capability, and they're just ignoring the facts on the ground. Or they're trying to keep contracts in their district. <laughs> that too. The social capability doesn't exactly build a sappy plate factory or no. do anything like that. It doesn't, it doesn't give you another battleship. It doesn't give you another aircraft carrier or submarine. It doesn't give you a brand new... F-35. But what it does give you is the ability to operate in modern conflict zones with some cultural capabilities, with some understanding of local economies, with some understanding of local, local social structure. But even, even better, what it does is it gives the military the tools to answer some of these questions and to figure out some of these things on the ground in real time. Because the situation, culture doesn't necessarily change very fast, but you know, economic systems, political systems, social systems can change a little bit quicker. And if you got people on the ground that can that have an understanding of this and can also help you figure it out in real time, well, then, you know, I, I put my teacher back, hat back on and I say, well, OK, now I've learned this and now I could teach it to you. So I think that this giving the keeping some kind of social capability in the military needs to be just as important as, you know, designing the latest fighter jet. And when we talk about a social capability, we're not saying that we need to be, uh, the Army needs a way to go out and do social research. We're not saying the Army needs to be anthropologists on the ground. Because anthropologists don't belong in a combat zone. AAA, the American Anthropology Association, is exactly right. Because you can't do anthropology. Fuck those guys. Yeah, right. That's Pete's opinion. I, maybe I agree. But you can't do proper research in a conflict zone and nobody's trying to do proper research what we're trying to do is give american soldiers american marines american sailors and airmen the capability to understand what they're walking into otherwise they're walking into a social situation blind and 
individuals in a human terrain type element may use social science research methodologies, but they're not saying that this research is going to be valid or generalizable or change the world. All they're saying is I use this methodology to prove that in this local area, this is what's going on and help the, the supported unit understand. An F-35 costs 300 plus million dollars. One F-35. And I will say this right now and put it up on the internet forever. Rich, Pete, and Will can go out right now for 10% of the cost and have much more impact than any F-35 can in its entire ability to do anything. And that's the bottom line. It, there's, yeah. there's no way they can outperform us. It, you pay me a proper amount, so not talking about SOCOM contracts paying $40,000 a year for guys who don't have bachelor's degrees, who don't know how to do research, because that's what's going on with the name Human Terrain on it right now. Pay me a proper amount and give me the latitude to do what needs to be done, which that means training military officers and leaders on how to use the capability because you can't just pay for a social science capability and expect it to be utilized. You have to train the operator how to operate it. That's like buying a backhoe and giving a guy a backhoe without the instruction book and saying, dig me a ditch. Oh, fuck, I don't know what to do with a backhoe. You got to teach him how to use the backhoe. So it's... It's there's two angles. You got to provide the capability and you got to teach soldiers how to use the capability. So, again, if you want to save money, you can have us go out and say, hey, don't paint that school. I mean, that that's going to be fifty thousand dollars to paint that school there. You just paid for for a quarter or maybe a 20th of Will's salary for the year by having him say, don't paint that school. Mm hmm. Don't don't, yeah. don't bring the sharpening tool out to a bazaar that has five blacksmiths in it and yeah. sharpen. 500 hose, the, the irrigation type or the, the field work hoe, not, uh, a, a corner. Not a street hoe. working hoe. Yeah, not a street not working hoe. Not a stroll. Hoe, not a woman but, of ill repute. Yeah, not a woman <laughs> of ill repute. But don't bring a capability in and ruin the local economy because if you can sharpen, I don't care if it goes 60 miles an hour and zero or zero to 60 in five seconds and you sharpen 50 tools in that day, that blacksmith might have taken three months to sharpen 50 tools. But guess what you just did to that blacksmith? You stole food off of his family's plate. You gave him a reason to gripe about the local government who you represent. And now, instead of just watching you, he might be watching you and telling his brother's cousin's uncle's nephew that, hey, the Americans are here. And you don't know where that information goes. So, and a commander doesn't think about that. A commander says... I've got a capability that's really going to help locals. I can sharpen their tools like they've never been sharpened before. And he doesn't think about the blacksmith in that bazaar who he just put out of business. So you've got this tool that costs $60,000 that we're going to give away. You've got an F-35 circling up at 35,000 feet waiting for something to happen that isn't going to happen that day. And you constantly do all these things. It's not hard to do small things. Like we already have a contract with an earth mover. I've done every time I go to deployment, I look for these obvious things, like things that we're going to give away that are already paid for an earth mover in the right area where the locals go to the government. They go to the police and they say, can we get the earth mover to fix the road over here? And I'm not talking build a new road. I'm talking pat down dirt on a dirt road. If they go to the governor for that, the governor gets to say, I'll make the Americans do that. And the American goes, yeah, sure, we'll support you. That's his job. Absolutely. You're the boss. That's what we're going to do. Now, that right there is free. Mm -hmm. Free, and it's a multiple win. The police get to go escort the earth mover. The people got to go to the governor. We got people to go to the government center and have something positive happen. And the Americans gave power to the governor. I mean, look at all that stuff. And how much did that cost? Nothing. It's already paid for. Mm -hmm. So if, if you want an F-35 and you want to spend $307 million, great. But how about we put people together who are able to look at problems like that and find smooth cultural ways to solve the very same problems that are, that are undermining everything we do so that we need an F-35 up in the air not doing anything. And that example, I want to dissect that example you just gave of people wanting a do road it. bill and going to the governor and the governor being able to make a choice and go to the Americans. That doesn't just happen. That that's meetings upon meetings upon meetings. And Rich, you just chuckled. What's your experience of a an Afghan shura that Americans are at? Who leads that? Uh, State Department guy. Yeah. USAID guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
And if the Afghans are even there, by the way, because what, what we start calling them, they're, they're an American shura. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Americans are having a shura. Because no, the Afghans decided a long time ago to stop showing up. Because, uh, you know, it's once again, the Americans are just checking off boxes. Exactly. So in order for Afghans to go to their governor and their governor to make a decision, it takes Americans who are willing to take a back seat. And that just does You don't take a back seat and get promoted because riding on a fit rep, I took a back seat and didn't say anything during a meeting. Doesn't look good. It'd be a lot better to say I spoke during a meeting, but that's not that's not what's needed. Nobody within the military is going to understand, stay silent, unless there's somebody who understands the social component and says, hey, sir, stay silent during this meeting. Just watch what happens. You don't need to do anything today. Let the governor take it. You look at that example with the Earth Mover, and you've got a military win because you're denying access to the Taliban. You've got a social win because people are moving towards the government. You've got a cultural win because you're staying within the cultural norm. They're solving problems themselves. You've got a political win because, again, people are looking at the government as something that's viable. You've added one-tenth of one millionth of a percent to the pile that you need to make, but there is a political win there. And there's no cross-religious problem with that at all. You didn't use religion, but you went through religion without causing any problems. You know, if you want to have a mullah there, go on, you have a mullah there, but that would be the only way to really improve that operation, and it was free. It was a free win just sitting there. But there is nobody in a military battalion, an infantry battalion, that has that capability based upon the training they received prior to deployment. No, how's that going to get anybody promoted? <laughs> you know, how, how are you going to demonstrate that win? You know, it's, 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 you, can, you can write about it. You know, but it's not it's not necessarily a box you can check off. Exactly. And if we're talking about how much money it costs, again, on an intel, I used to be an intel guy. On an intel side, fighting a traditional war, a conventional war, hundreds of millions of dollars are spent on being able to use radar, being able to tell that a, a BMP, 70 BMPs went down this trail three hours ago on surveillance stuff. But that's for a conventional war. Mm-hmm. And wars we fight aren't conventional unless we get in a war with China, Russia, or Brazil, or one of our European allies if Trump becomes president and we say, fuck NATO, uh, then we might get in a war with them. But unless we get in a war with them, every single country is going to look around and say, holy cow, if we get in a war with America, the template was just made. Let's dissolve and do an insurgency. Nobody's going to stand up to us in a conventional war when all they have to do is dissolve and they can outlast us because we don't have the willpower to last for 10 or 15 years in a conflict. We really just geeked out on war, (laughs) but I think it was good. I hope you guys all enjoyed that. Uh, We are glad to do more shows like this. Got a big dose of modern combat and just how challenging it is. Duncan Hunter, thanks for playing along. We actually do like you. We'd love to actually sit down and talk like we've discussed. And uh, in general, taxpayers, voters, reach out to your local representatives send them a letter send them a link to this show and say why is this even a problem why why are rich pete and will so so willing to go do something yet that is so needed yet why are we not doing it use your voice vote for sure but also write a letter send a link say this is important they'll listen 